Welcome, everybody. So we're getting on to another part of well, ultrasound. And please, everybody is welcome to contribute. Uh, the only reason I muted the mics was just so that uh, we don't get any feedback noise and things like that. But um, you're more than welcome to ask questions, either chat, direct, whatever it may be. I hope you can hear me OK. I'm trying out the mic over here. So technically, the aortic assessment or looking at the aorta doesn't uh, actually form part of the uh, eFAST assessment per se. All right. But uh, we, we do include it in certain circumstances. OK. So it's an important skill to learn. Uh, the thing is, why should I assess the aorta? I mean, uh, it's not like people are coming in with aortic dissections all on its own. But the thing is, you are looking at it in terms of a patient who has severe abdominal pain uh, and was in shock at the same time. All right. Now, there's uh, another lecture that we're going to cover in a few weeks' time called the uh, Rush Protocol, which is rapid, uh, rapid ultrasound in shock and hypotension. Um, you know, but uh, the thing is, if we rush through and um, you know just do that without looking at the aorta on its own, it will get a bit uh, difficult to actually understand the Rush Protocol la later on. All right. So what we're trying to exclude when we're looking at the aorta is we're trying to exclude abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, we're trying to exclude two things. The first thing is that it is dissecting, all right? And the other thing is that we may potentially see one that is growing and we could actually save that uh, person, person's life, sorry, not life. So these are the two reasons that we actually look at the aorta. And it's quite easy if you are looking at the IVC uh, and if you know how to look at the inferior vena cava, then actually looking at the abdominal aorta is just as easy. So we're just going to cover a few aspects in it. It's not a very long talk. It's not uh, a huge topic, but it is something that kind of deserves its just its own little time. Okay. So the question is where to begin. So we begin exactly where we uh, began when we wanted to look at the inferior vena cava. The aorta sits just to the left-hand side of it, right? So if you remember, once we place our probe with the indicator facing towards the patient's right, we basically look for the vertebral body. And when we see the vertebral body, we see this uh, half moon. Uh, and then remember the bone is not allowing any feedback of uh, ultrasound beam. So we get a big shadow, it's coming out of the way. And then we see this pulsatile mass that is the aorta. And we see the larger, less pulsatile uh, inferior vena cava. Okay, so actually finding it is quite easy. And the easiest place to always start is just around the umbilicus, uh, normally about a centimeter or two above. And uh, the main thing that you have to worry about is bowel gas, if your patient has a large amount of adipose and things like that. Um, adipose, you just increase the depth. If it's bowel gas, you just keep pressure on. So what will happen with bowel gas, the whole thing just looks a bit hazy. You can't really make out an exact structure. But once you keep pressure on the probe, eventually the, the, the entire picture just kind of clears up and then you can have a look and see. Okay, all right. So today we're going to basically have a look at uh, a video that's gonna show us exactly what we need to look for. Uh, then we're going to see a few GIFs, uh, GIFs, whatever you want to call them, aneurysms. I was hoping to do a practical demonstration if I was at the uh, at the hospital, but unfortunately, because I'm away at the moment, I'll have to leave that for another time. But uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to at least see the others. So this is the area that we are concentrating at. All right. So you've got your thoracic aorta that's running all the way over there. You've got your diaphragm over there. And essentially, we're looking at this part. We're looking at this abdominal aorta, right? So this is what a healthy uh, aorta should look like. And this is what an aortic aneurysm should, generally can look like, right? So uh, let's get into that. Uh, and actually, the video can explain a lot more than I can. But let's just have a look at it and see, OK? And then we're going to try and learn a few things from there. So yeah, let's take it from there. Hello, my name is Jacob Avila, and today I'm going to talk to you about how you can diagnose this guy right here, this aortic aneurysm that is leaking in this case, how you can identify this with a bedside ultrasound. 
So the probe of choice you're going to be using is the curvilinear or the phase rate transducer. The vast majority of AAAs are going to be infrarenal, and luckily for us, this is a pretty easy area to evaluate with ultrasound. So how good are we at doing this? This was a meta-analysis that was published in 2013 and asked the exact same question. They included seven studies with 655 patients, and they found that our sensitivity for diagnosing AAAs was 99%, and our specificity was 98%. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat. When you look at all the specific studies that they used, they actually excluded patients in which they could not visualize the aorta. So if you can't see the aorta, you can't say it, there's an aneurysm or not. But this number in most of the studies was actually fairly small, like less than 5%. So going back to our cartoon, we're going to be looking at the abdominal aorta in cross section. So with the patient lying down supine, we're going to place the probe anteriorly at the midline. And we're going to get an image that looks like this. So we have our aorta here on the left. We have a flatter IVC on the right. And this right here, this little arch looking thing, this is the vertebral body. Bony structures will actually absorb sound. So that's why you get this shadow, this kind of drop out of an image beneath it. But you should be able to see the cortex pretty well. And here's the ultrasound image of the exam. So the first image that we need to look for right here, this is pretty high up. This is, you want to start in the epigastrium. Here is the aorta, and this is the celiac trunk. That's kind of the first little branch point. And you can follow that down. So here I'm moving a little more towards the feet, a little more in a caudal orientation. And then right here, we have the SMA. Some people call that the mantle clock sign. So the IMA is kind of difficult to visualize, so we don't really look for that. And you want to follow the aorta all the way down until it gets the bifurcation of the iliacs, which is going to happen right about here, right there. So now we have two iliacs. So here's doing the examination on a real patient. You start in the epigastrum here, you find the aorta, and you just track the thing all the way down. Make sure you optimize your depth. You find the thing all the way down. And this happens a lot. This is bowel gas that's in the way. So what I do here is I'll just hold general pressure. You can see when I push a little bit, you can see that bowel shadow in the way. And I'll just hold pressure, and eventually that aorta will pop into view. There's that bowel gas, and there's that aorta. So you basically follow that all the way down. Always optimize your depth, follow you all the way down until right about there we see the aorta actually splitting. So there's aorta. And then right there it splits into two iliacs. Now what happens often is this split into the iliacs happens right at the belly button and the belly button's full of air. So you can do one of two things. You can either fill the belly button with the ultrasound gel, which kind of is a little bit weird. Or what you can do is just put the probe either caudally or cranially to the umbilicus to the belly button, and then angle it, fan it either cranially or caudally, whichever way you need to go to find that iliac. You just kind of fan until you find it. That's usually the way that I do it. So when you see a normal aorta like this, that's good. A triple A is going to look like this. It makes sense. It's just a big aorta. Here's an example of a not normal aorta. So here we're seeing that little, this aorta that's supposed to be small and kind of over here, we can see it's actually very enlarged. It actually moves a little more towards the midline in this case. If we measure that, it would definitely be abnormal. Here's another one. Now you can see a bowel gas issue here and we push down and then we can see this big aorta here. Now, when we throw color flow on this, oftentimes with these triple A's, there's only gonna be a small portion of that aorta that's actually gonna have flow in it. And this can actually, be something that trips you up. When you're measuring the size of the aorta, don't measure the lumen where there's blood flow. You got to measure the entire aorta. So outer wall to outer wall. That's extremely important because if you just measure this, you'll grossly underestimate the size of that AAA. You can definitely get a view in the longitudinal orientation, but it's much less useful and you run the risk of underestimating the size of you measuring that view. Let me try to explain that a little bit better. So imagine you have a cross-sectional view of the aorta here and you're bringing your probe in a longitudinal orientation down here. Now, if you get this perfect slice right in the center, then you'll probably get a good measurement of the aorta. But if you're oblique, so if you're slicing it over here instead, you're going to underestimate the size of that AAA. And most AAAs or most diseased aortas are not going to be in a perfectly straight line. So it's going to be difficult for you to know if you're oblique or if you're perfectly in the center of that lumen. For that reason, we usually measure the diameter of the aorta in cross section, not in longitudinal. Speaking of which, if you need a mnemonic to remember at what size an aorta becomes aneurysmal, it's pretty easy. So AAA, AAA, three letters, one, two, three. A AAA greater than three centimeters is considered abnormal. 
Now, many places state that you need to look at the abdominal aorta and measure it at its most proximal, mid, and just above the iliac bifurcation. I feel like this actually takes a lot of work. So what I do instead is I'll take a clip of the entire aorta, then measure once at the widest point. If you don't have recording capabilities and have to print images to place on a physical chart, then you probably should take those three measurements. But if your machine can record clips, just record clips and take one measurement at its widest point. Five centimeters is definitely another number to tuck in the back of your mind. Greater than five centimeter AAA is pretty abnormal and more likely to be causing your patient's symptoms. Another thing too is that you can use the width of the vertebral bodies to estimate the size of the aorta. So the average width of the vertebral bodies at L1 through L5 is actually around four to five centimeters. So you can kind of use that to grossly estimate the size of that AAA. Another reason you have to make sure to evaluate the entire aorta is that there is a rarer form of a AAA called a saccular aneurysm, and this is what it looks like here. These guys are rare, but this is a good reason to make sure that you evaluate the entire aorta, not just one section, because you might have just a focal area of aneurysm like you see here. So to recap, a abdominal aortic aneurysm greater than three centimeters is considered abnormal. You wanna place that probe in the anterior abdominal wall and look pretty much as high up as you can in the abdomen, so right at the epigastrium, and you wanna go all the way down until you get to the split of the aorta into the iliac arteries. Okay, so I hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, it's a good uh, video to watch once or twice, and uh, he actually makes a good point about quite a few things, especially when it comes to bowel gas and things like that. Now, this that I wanted to show you guys was just for interest sake, um, because they are, there's definitely three parts to the aorta, right? So the first part is above the, uh, whatchamacallit, the uh, celiac trunk. And the second part is basically at the superior mesenteric artery, right? The reason why I wanted you guys to see this is just so that you know the language of it, uh, because sometimes uh, it may be difficult, especially if you're reading a radiology report and they talk about certain signs and things like that. Uh, we don't want you to get lost, all right? So let's just have a look at this one here. So this is the aorta that we're sitting with over here. And we've got the celiac trunk that's going off over there, right? So we've got the hepatic artery and the splenic artery. And this is actually called the seagull sign, all right? So the reason for that, it looks like a seagull with its uh, wings spread out. Sorry. Sorry about that. There's a helicopter flying overhead here. So that would tell you that you're in the right place as well. Now, this is a very good picture of it. It's normally, uh, you know, you normally see one part and then the other part coming in, but that's more or less what that is. So that tells you that you're uh, just at the right place for the first part of the aorta. And then the second part of the aorta between the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery is the second part, basically. Right? So here we have the aorta again. Here we have the IVC. And then this is called the mantle sign. Right? The reason why it's called the mantle, I'm sure most of you have seen on, on movies and things like that, you used to have these old types of mantle clocks that used to sit on top of the uh, cupboards and they would have a shape resembling like this with a flat body and then it would loop over and then you'd have the clock face in between. Now, th these are just nice things to know. You don't necessarily have to remember that. It's just for interest sake. And sometimes it can help you when you're describing it to, uh, let's say, the, the surgeon or the uh, vascular surgeon so that they also get an idea that you know what you're talking about, right? And then the, the third part is basically from the, from the SMA all the way down to the bifurcation, right? So what you'll see then uh, is that you'll see the vertebral body, like you said, inferior vena cava, and then the aorta. There we see a bit of the mantle sign. And as you keep on going down, Eventually, what will happen is this aorta will start to bifurcate. So you can see as this aorta, as we move closer to the belly button, you start getting the two common iliacs coming out. So that's the way that you assess a normal aorta, and that's how a normal aorta should look. Now, what happens is very often we may have patients who are quite thin and we have palpable masses, and you know, they always taught us that the palpable mass may just be a normal aorta. You may have a patient unexplained hypotension. You may have a patient with unexplained abdominal pain. There's no harm in going and looking at the aorta. In fact, it just takes a couple of minutes. It is easier definitely to look at it in the transverse view for that same reason that he was mentioning it. The thing is, if you get it longitudinally, right? Let's imagine that it is longitudinal. 
Basically, what he was saying is that if you cut through here, then you'll definitely see the width properly. The problem is that if you're slightly off the center, you won't get the exact uh, measurements that you're supposed to get. Now, in saying that, even in the transverse view, you've got to make sure that your probe is 90 degrees to the skin. Because what happens is if, you're, if your probe is not 90 degrees to the skin, it actually sees the aorta a bit larger than what it should be. So just be careful with that. Uh, basically, when you're doing your measurement, just be 100% sure that you are uh, 90 degrees to the aorta, you know, and you can try it out. When you move the, the if you sort of uh, fan the, 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 uh, the probe back and forth, you'll actually see the same spot suddenly become larger and smaller and larger and smaller, okay? And then just remember that once you hit the bifurcation, then you know that you're looking at the common iliacs, which is something we'll, we'll talk about later in the year, uh, because the common iliacs actually help you look for other landmarks in the abdomen, okay. All right, so let's look at some aneurysms, okay. So I wonder if anybody can tell me what's going on there, because that's an aorta. All right, now we're not necessarily looking at measurement, but, uh, I'm not sure if anybody can see this aorta and what's happening over there. We see this enlarged sort of undulating mass that's moving around all over there, all right? So it's moving around quite a bit, but you can see it quite easily. And this is in a longitudinal view, all right? And then if we look at this one here, now this is a, a good view of an aneurysm, all right? So we're in the bottom part or the infrarenal space, okay? So the main thing is to take note of, right? You can still see the vertebral body there at the bottom, right? You can still see the IVC, but look at the size of that aorta, right? So even if you're not sure how to do exact measurements, if you take, for example, that this should be about five centimeters, you can look at, you can, if you look at this at its widest, it's actually coming out to about six or seven centimeters. And what we're seeing over here is lumen, right? So that's the lumen over there. And all this that we are seeing is uh, thrombus, okay? So that's part of the aneurysm, okay? So it, uh, that's the, the entire wall of the aorta, the outer wall is actually there. And this is what happens to aortas when they dissect. Generally, you get a bit of the intima that separates, and then you get fluid that leaks in between the intima, the media, and the externa. And that's actually what creates that aneurysm, right? Because a dissection means that it's gonna go through all, and it's going to start leaking. All right, let's have a look at another one. All right, so here we go again. We're looking at some aorta. So this is a nice one to look at as well. So here we can see we're also in that infrarenal space and we can see a nice large aorta. And as they just start moving a little bit, uh, it looks like they're moving a bit inferiorly. That's when you can see the actual uh, thrombus that's uh, there or the aneurysm that's over there as well. And when, if you were to measure, you would measure from there to there. Now this one is quite large because you can see how it dwarfs the IVC and how it dwarfs the vertebral body at the bottom. I mean, it's quite a massive aneurysm. So these patients are in danger and these patients normally present you with severe, severe back pain. It doesn't remit no matter what you are doing. You know, you can give them as much analgesia as you want. You can almost, almost put them under anesthesia and they'll still be screaming in pain. But the biggest clue is actually the drop in the BP because they start leaking into this area quite actively. So you start getting this BP that's just going down and down and patients becoming more and more shocked. You know? So this is another good one. Now this is a giant triple A, all right? This is at least 10 centimeters. You can notice that we can't even see the IVC all that well. Even the vertebral body is difficult to see. And this is an intimal flap, all right? So this little thing that you see over here. So that, uh, I mean, this is the, well, that's the lumen, that's the, the, the thrombus that's formed. And this is an intimal flap. So that's actually just a flap of the intima that's moving around freely with each and every uh, beat. Uh, each and every heartbeat that's going on. So once you've got an intimal flap, that's also a danger sign uh, because it, it lets you know that, listen, this thing is going to start leaking quite actively. And the aortic external wall has, can only take that much of pressure before it ruptures as well. And once it ruptures, I mean, it's like putting up a hole in a huge hose pipe. Your patient can exsanguinate within a, a few minutes, you know? So luckily we do have these symptoms that patients present with of severe pain, 
dropping BPs and things like that, you know. Now, uh, the question that somebody may ask is, all right, so I've got a patient like this, what can I do in the emergency department? Uh, actually, there's not much that you can do because you, you try and keep their fluids up, you try and keep them stable because this patient needs to go to theater. Now, not every hospital has a, uh, what you call it, a vascular surgeon or uh, maybe has vascular grafts and things like that. So what happens is in some of the smaller hospitals, uh, what the surgeons will do is they'll actually do a thoracotomy. And when they do the thoracotomy, they will uh, clamp the aorta above the diaphragm so that just so that there's no possibility of leakage down here. And once that happens, uh, then they have to, of course, have urgent transfer because now the amount of ischemia that you are causing further down is quite extensive. If you've got an experienced surgeon in your hospital, they will attempt a graft, even if it's a temporary graft. Um, like for instance, at Maradani, we've got Mr. Chedi who would be able to do it, maybe Dr. Altcherek uh, and things like that, but at some of the hospitals, they may not be able to. All right. So let's see, what does a dissection look like, all right? So this is basically an aorta that's pumping away over there, all right? But what's happened is it's broken through, all right? And this is where the dissection has happened. Okay, so it's broken through and it's now leaking fluid. Well, say leaking fluid, it's now leaking blood, all right? You can see the amount of blood that's surrounding the aorta and you can see that lift up of that, uh, that external layer of the aorta. And that's just what is leaking. All right, it's a short, a, a short picture. I mean, if you had to see it for a lot longer, you'd actually see that start to spread and spread and spread. And uh, this is another one that we see over here where we can actually see that the walls have been ruptured and we see the amount of thrombus that's formed around over there with a massive intimal flap over here. So there's definitely leakage, okay? Now these patients are in extreme danger. They are, they are bleeding, uh, they are dissecting at the moment. You don't have much time. Uh, it's, it's something that you need to rush into theater as quickly as possible. At least even if you have a semi-competent surgeon, they can even cross clamp the aorta in the uh, abdomen, even if they don't go for a thoracotomy, they can do basic grafts, they can try and do bypasses, but it's a difficult thing. And normally these end up going down to vascular surgery. So we had a, a young lady, I think it was last year or the year before, who presented to us with what looked like a uterine mass. And, uh, you know, everybody was pushing this thing and poking this, uh, not poking, but pushing it and, and pressing on it and trying to figure out what the hell it was. And um, when we sent her for an ultrasound, uh, because at that stage, our ultrasound was actually out of commission. And, and they found something similar to this, uh, something that was called a false aneurysm. Um, and she had it extending all the way from the second part right down into the common iliacs. And uh, I can tell you, we all got the shock of our life. Uh, because uh, this, this, she was uh, actually taken immediately to Nkosi Albert Lituli. They tried to graft her, the first graft function, and uh, eventually she went, she had to go for a second grafting because the first one was failing, and unfortunately she passed away, and she was just 19 years old. So, you know, you, you, these things can happen at, at uh, it doesn't have to only happen at the extremes of age. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the end of the lecture. Uh, I, I like I told you, it's not a very long one today. I was hoping at this point I would have done a practical dissection, a practical demonstration in the ANE with a volunteer. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an ultrasound machine at home to be able to show you guys. But uh, I just wanted to know if you had any questions or anything that you would like to know, or anything that just seems a bit confusing or a bit worrying. These are not things that you are going to see every day. This is something that you may see about three to four times a year if you work full time in the emergency department. But it's the type of thing that if you are doing ultrasounds on a regular basis that you can practice. And then when you do see one, you can potentially save a patient's life. Um, the, 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 uh, the more extreme the age, in other words, the, the older you get, the more common it is to have these aneurysms as well. Okay. Um, thoracic aneurysms, surprisingly, are more common in younger people, uh, but we'll discuss that much later on in the year. Um, and uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm is much more common in the elderly, um, but you can get either in either age group as well. So, um, yeah, that's basically it for uh, the aorta. Like I say, it's not a very long, long topic, um, but the truth is that as we're moving on, and as you guys are learning more, it is something that you need to know.
So I'm not sure if there's any questions or if everybody's happy. Um, let me just put up the video panel over here. You can give me a thumbs up if you're happy or a thumbs down if you still don't understand anything. Or there's still something that's worrying you. Not sure. Okay. Everybody happy? I understand what's going on. Did I speak a bit fast? Yes, doctor. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. I know I have a habit sometimes of uh, going through things a bit quickly because I've been doing them for so long. So I, I, if there's any issues, or even if you don't have a question right now, and if you rewatch it, or let's say even the people who watch this later on, uh, you know, on the recording, you're more than welcome to send me any sort of questions and things like that. And uh, I'll try and answer to the best of my ability. Okay. But it's an interesting thing. It's uh, really something that when you find it, and I found two or three over the years, it's one of those things that gets your heart pumping as well, because you realize, you know, the, 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 the shit is about to hit the fan over here. Because when you're working in an emergency department, generally you get the symptomatic patients. Um, you do occasionally get the asymptomatic patients and you find this by accident, but uh, they are less common in an emergency department. You may find they, they tend to be more, it tends to be more of an incidental finding. Um, but most of the patients that we do get, or at least the two or three that we've had over the years, uh, have been uh, quite symptomatic. I remember one elderly lady, she must have been about 88 came into us screaming with pain, absolutely screaming in pain because she was dissecting and BPs were just dropping. And, uh, you know, I must be honest, initially, you know, I was busy with another uh, patient. So I, I was like, you know, let's give her some pethidine, let's calm her down. We even gave her, what you might call it, uh, a bit of morphine to top up the pethidine and she just wasn't settling down. And once I put this thing on and I saw it, I was like, oh, shit, this is bad. We immediately rushed her into CT. She still wasn't doing too well, got the surgeons. And it couldn't have been more than about half an hour from the start of her presentation before she passed away, because she just dissected and she just leaked everything into the abdomen. There wasn't even a chance to get it to the other. So you do get those bad ones sometimes, but um, hopefully it's something that uh, people will learn from. And uh, just remember those numbers as well. Three centimeters, more than three centimeters get worried. More than five centimeters get very worried. If you see an internal flap like what you see here, get very worried as well. Okay, but a lot of them that you'll find may be symptomatic, or, but are still salvageable. And those are the ones that you need to get a CT scan done as urgently as possible. Get your surgeons involved. Try and stabilize the patient as much as possible. And remember, if you have a patient who's got an extreme or a giant aorta, don't try and get their BPs up too high. You're actually aiming just for a mean arterial pressure of 60. That's it. You just need blood getting into the kidneys, getting into the brain, and getting into the heart. Once you go above that, you are going to actually increase the amount of bleeding that you're going to have, and you're going to increase the chances of a rupture. The reason why I say that is it is our reflex that if a patient is hypovolemic, we must make our patient normal volemic. In these cases, normal volemia is one of the worst things that you can do. Okay, so uh, just remember that. It also applies to trauma patients who are actively bleeding or any patient that's actively bleeding. Don't just try and get their BPs up to normal. Try and get their mean arterial pressure to 60 because once you go above that, all that you're going to do is cause hydrostatic pressure behind the whatever clots have formed, uh, whatever's tamponading and holding things in place are just going to be shot off because you increase the pressure so heavily. Okay, so that's just some general advice as well. And uh, yeah, if there's no other questions, then uh, I guess we'll end. And I hope to see you guys uh, again on, on Friday. Uh, we'll be talking about, um, what is it this Friday? It's ears, ear trauma, uh, ear injuries, how to suture an ear, how to anesthetize an ear, how to remove an ear. No, I'm just joking, I don't remove it. And uh, <laughs> all of that. So I hope you guys will join me then. And like I say, if there's any other questions, then. Uh, Please, you can, you're always welcome to message me again. But for right now, bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. And I hope uh, you'll learn something from it. Okay, bye.